It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's loyal opposition. Good morning, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, we learned of the latest lawsuit brought by Crosslakes, the P3 partner for the Eglinton Crosstown LRT. It's another day, another lawsuit. Uh, in fact, since this government took office, Metrolinx has paid out more than half a billion dollars to settle lawsuits brought by Crosslinks. Liberals and Conservatives always say that the whole point of public-private partnerships is supposedly to avoid cost overruns and risks to the public. But the Eglinton Crosstown P3 has been a total fiasco for the public, for small businesses, for Ontario. How much more will the public be forced to pay before this government accepts that P3s are riskier, take longer, and cost more than publicly procured projects? To respond, Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, let me say to the, mem to the Leader of the Opposition, um, we share the, her frustration with the delays with the Eglinton Crosstown, and the uh, litigation that was announced yesterday is another delay tactic by CTS, which is completely unacceptable. People who live along Eglinton, businesses who are there uh, have suffered greatly, um, but our government is focused on making sure that the Eglinton Crosstown opens as quickly as possible, but when it opens, that it is safe for transit riders. And let me be clear, Mr. Speaker, our government has been looking out for taxpayers since day one. That's why when we brought forward our plan for subways for the GTA, we introduced legislation, the Building Transit Faster Act, to make sure we can get shovels in the ground faster, which reduces delays and also helps control costs. But Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition and her party voted against our plan. They voted Response. against Building Transit Faster. We're going to get it done for the people of Ontario, and we're going to stand up for transit riders and taxpayers. Supplementary question. Speaker, this government has been in power for five years. It's time they started taking responsibility yeah. for what's happening under their government. In her 2018 report, the Auditor General said Metrolinx should not have paid Crosslinx $237 million to settle its first lawsuit. But Metrolinx did pay. Then Crosslinx sued again. And Metrolinx paid again. And now Crosslinks has sued again. And not only that, the P3 project has been delayed until 2024 at the earliest. So back to the Premier, how many lawsuits and how many delays will it take before this government abandons its costly and risky obsession with P3s? Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, um, in addition to the well-known ideological opposition the NDP have towards building housing, they're also opposed to building transit, no. and they will find every Order. excuse to not build transit. Yeah. That's why they voted against our subway plan. Even though they get up in this House every day asking for more transit, they vote against it when they have the chance, Mr. Line. Speaker. We put forward a plan to address the transit deficit that we inherited from the Liberals, Mr. Speaker, and they voted against it. They voted against building transit faster, Mr. Speaker, which is actually hard to believe given the challenges that we are facing with the Eglinton Crosstown. The legislation we brought forward is, is the purpose of that is to address the mistakes of the previous Liberal government. When they signed the contract in 2011 with Crosstown, this is a contract we have inherited. Response. We take responsibility for making sure that we get this done. But when we do that, Mr. Speaker, we commit to the people of Ontario. We're going to get it done, and it is going to be safe for transit riders when it does open. The final supplementary. Yeah, yes. Speaker, let's talk ideology, because this is a government that continues down a terrible road purely based on ideology, and it's not working. Yesterday, the Minister of Transportation said she had learned the lessons of P3 failures of the previous Liberal government, but the only lesson that she seems to have learned is how to funnel more public money to private P3 contractors. Her subway P3s now cost $1 billion per kilometre, nearly three times what Toronto's publicly procured Spadina subway extension cost just six years ago. In 2018, the UK government abandoned P3s after years of costly fiascos. Why won't the Premier do the same instead of doubling down on Liberal P3 failures? 
to please take their seats. Minister of Transportation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, let me be clear. The Lib previous Liberal government signed the contract with CTS, and the Ontario taxpayer has paid billions of dollars for the Eglinton Crosstown. And our government is committed to making sure that CTS delivers us a credible schedule, which will then lead to a, an opening date, which the people across, Egl across Toronto have been waiting for for a very, very long time, Mr. Speaker. But we have learned the lessons that the Liberals should have learned when they were in power. And we have taken those lessons and we put them in a piece of legislation. We put them as part of our subway project for the subway plan for the GTA. But Mr. Speaker, the members opposite voted against it. They would rather the people of the GTA sit in, on congested roads as opposed to build, buy, building and riding Response. on new subways and extended lines, Mr. Speaker. That is unacceptable for the people of Toronto. We're committed to getting it done. We're standing up for transit riders, and we're standing up for taxpayers. Thank you very much. The next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Um, my next question is again to the Premier. Yesterday, an FAO report on women's participation in the labour market found no progress on addressing the gender wage gap over the past decade. With women earning just 87 cents for every dollar earned by men in 2022. Instead of efforts to close the wage gap, the government has chosen to widen it. They'd prefer to spend money taking nurses and midwives and teachers to court rather than pay them a fair wage. Will the Premier stop fighting to keep women's wages down and end his efforts to legislate a gendered wage gap in Ontario? Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the FAO report is actually saying we've done significant work and are seeing more women entering to the workforce because of the actions of this government, such as investing in millions in, and seeing women get skills and development training, education, encouraging women and investing in women entering into the trades where there is pay equity. We've seen significant investments in better jobs to cover expenses, including childcare, tuition, transportation for short-term training programs, micro-credentials. We've expanded the Investing Women's Futures program, the Women's Economic Security program, and millions are going into the budget that we hope the members opposite will support. In fact, the FAO actually says that in 2022, labour participation rates for Ontario core-age mothers reach 81.7 percent, the highest on record since 1976, and that is increasing. We're going to continue to make these investments, Mr. Speaker, the wage gap. We are. Thank you. Thank you. This supplementary question. The minister's creative interpretation of the report notwithstanding, this government continues to show how just completely out of touch they are with the reality that women in our province are facing. Uh, we are in an affordability crisis, and women are paying a much bigger price. When you have one income and you have kids at home, you cannot afford the skyrocketing cost of housing and groceries with 87 cents on the dollar. This government fumbled the implementation of affordable childcare in this province, stalling an estimated 96,600 women from entering the labour force. I want to go back to the Premier again, who's sitting right there in front of me and could be answering this question to the women of, of this province. The FAO says we will be short 220,000 childcare spaces to meet the demand. Is he just going to keep kicking this can down the road? Women's social and economic opportunity. We have secured a significant investment and agreement for childcare, the largest across any other province. If we listened to the members opposite, we would have only settled for $10 billion. We have $13.5 billion for the Child Care Agreement Act. And, Mr. Speaker, we've increased 86,000 new child care spaces by 2026. Everything the members opposite keep saying no to and actually hurting women from getting into the marketplace, into working. I've gone across the province, Mr. Speaker. I've met with hundreds of women who are getting into the workforce, taking advantages of the programs and investments this government has made. Yeah. I just wonder if the members opposite are going to support the budget that's coming up, plus the millions of dollars in investments, the, the mining agreement. There are women getting into these sectors in droves, Mr. Speaker, and we're going to work hard to make sure they stay here. 
final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. And uh, back to the Premier. Uh, and, and I would remind the members opposite that early childhood educators in this province are leaving faster than we can hire them. Uh, because let's get it straight, as long as we treat ECEs uh, like their work isn't as important as everybody else's, we're not going to be filling those jobs and we won't be bringing more women back into the labour force. Speaker, almost a quarter of working women are in part-time jobs. That's nearly double the number of men. We are only a third of senior management and middle management roles, and that wage gap is persisting in every single sector. For the Premier, 87 cents on the, draw, on the dollar would amount to about a $27,000 pay cut for him. Does he really think that that's fair, and would he accept that? Members, will please take their seats. To respond to the government, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we didn't sign any deal with the federal government. We signed a better deal for the people of this province. A billion additional dollars. An additional year of funding guarantee that no province had. It is this Premier that did what the NDP and Liberals couldn't do for 15 years, which is reduce childcare fees for generations to come. 50 per cent reduction. Mr. Speaker, we are literally talking about ten to twelve thousand dollars per child per year, and we're going to go even further to ten dollars per year 2025. The Minister of Women's Economic and Social Opportunities is leading by example, ensuring that more women are working in our economy with the recognition Order. we can do more. We're cutting taxes. We're ensuring women in the skilled trades. We're ensuring more young girls get into STEM disciplines within our schools. If the members opposite want to stand up for labour market participation, women Spons? vote for our budget. Vote Vote for opportunity. Vote for a plan that makes life affordable for moms and dads across Ontario. The next question, the member for Waterloo. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. With oh, my questions to the Premier. With over 600,000 people and 120 wells in Kitchener-Waterloo, this is the largest community in Canada dependent on groundwater for a majority of its drinking water. We've known for decades that the aquifer providing this water is particularly vulnerable to contamination. The Grand River Conservation Authority has been key to protecting this vital resource while supporting growth and housing. Bill 23 drastically reduces the powers of conservation authorities to protect our water. Why does this government believe that it makes sense to increase the risk that the region of Waterloo's water sources become contaminated? Why are you gambling with source water protection in Ontario? Remind members to make their comments through the chair. To respond for the government, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, we were crystal clear with Bill 23, crystal. including ensuring that the environment is protected, but at the same time, we're going to build much-needed homes. We're in the middle of a housing crisis, and New Democrats seem to not want to acknowledge that. They don't want to acknowledge that there are young people that are living in Waterloo Region today that can't realize the dream of home ownership. Zero there are chance. seniors who want to downsize but don't have a home that meets their needs and their budget at their disposal. This is the impetus for why we took this plan to the people last June. We got a significant mandate under the leadership of Premier Ford. We are going to build housing, and we are going to provide hope and opportunity here, here. for newcomers right. to our right. province, for seniors, and for young families. Supplementary question. Back to the member from Waterloo. Thank you. The, the region of Waterloo passed amendments to build 121,000 additional homes before Bill 23 passed. So this government claims they had to strip away the powers of conservation authority to protect our water to get new homes built, but this does not hold up to scrutiny. The region of Waterloo was already leading. We know what happens when water isn't protected in Waterloo region. Elmira's water sources are still too contaminated to drink and may never be restored after years of weak regulation. Concerns have come from many other regions in addition, Mr. Speaker. The 113 Ontario municipalities within the Great Lakes and St. Lawrence Cities Initiative have been examining the impact of Bill 23, and they are raising legitimate concerns. When will this government put people and the water that they rely on as a priority ahead of your personal private interests? Once again, I'll remind members to make their comments. The chair. Members will take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. 
Speaker, you know whose interest I'm, uh, I'm standing up with? Kids. It's the mayors of the communities in Waterloo Region that have signed on to our housing pledge and are our, our partners and moving forward to ensure that we have those 1.5 million homes built by 2031. Every single mayor uh, in those fastest growing communities has signed on with us to move forward. So we're very, very happy with the mayors of Kitchener, Waterloo, the chair of Waterloo Region. They've all come out publicly uh, to acknowledge that we're in a housing crisis, and they are our partners. I want to celebrate and congratulate them, not talk down like the member from Waterloo does. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. With a growing wave of crime everywhere across Canada, communities are rightfully concerned. In Ontario, we're seeing a rise in crime in cities of all sizes and in our rural communities. Every day, we see and hear new reports of serious crime throughout the province. These trends are disturbing, and this is not acceptable. Everyone in Ontario deserves to be safe in their communities, including the police officers who respond to these calls to protect us. Here, here. Our government must take urgent action now and explore all options to combat the surge in criminal activity. Speaker, can the Premier please explain what actions our government is taking to make Ontario's communities safer? To reply, the Premier. I, I want to thank the great member from Chatham, uh, Kent Leamington, and I also want to thank him. Um, for being years of an OPP officer. We're so proud to have him down in the, the legislature. And uh, as, as we uh, tackle uh, the, the crime that we've seen around the province, we're making sure we're giving the police, the police services across Ontario the tools that they need to get the job done, to make sure our communities are a lot safer, that you're able to walk out at night, you're able to take transit here in Toronto without worrying about being abused or physically hurt. We're adding more recruits to the Ontario Police College every single year, Mr. Speaker. We're investing another $13 million to fight guns and gangs that will stop illegal drugs from coming into our province. We're cracking down on auto thefts, adding Response. $51 million in new measures to find and dismantle crime networks across this province, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. To all police officers across Ontario, please know that this government and the people of Ontario appreciate your hard work and dedication each and every day. Thank you. When we call on our police officers to keep our communities safe, they're always there to respond and to serve. However, our frontline officers are regularly exposed to traumatic events while responding to calls that are increasingly complex and increasingly dangerous. All of this takes a toll on both their physical and mental health. In the past, most officers attempted to cope with trauma on their own and without professional help. All police officers deserve to have access to the care and supports when they need it, where they need it. Speaker, can the Premier please explain what actions our government is taking to support the health and wellness of all our frontline officers? And the Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, I agree with the great uh, member from Chatham-Kent Leamington about showing respect for our police officers. What is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker, is when school boards are disallowing police officers in uniform to go in there with one of their kids. That's what's disgusting, Mr. Speaker, and that, that's being changed, and thank goodness for that. That's why in our budget we announced an additional $9.6 million to support the Runnymede Health Care Centre to provide mental health supports and PTSI uh, treatment tailor-made for unique needs of our police officers and frontline workers. And we must always ensure that our dedicated respond first responders have the access to the highest quality of mental health and addictions care that meets its needs. We will always ensure the brave women and men that serve on our police forces are treated Once. with dignity and respect. Thank you. Next question, member for Nickelback. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Solicitor General. Speaker, this morning I was joined by Northern MPPs to discuss the need for 911 everywhere in Ontario. Every year, families living and visiting Northern Ontario discover in their times of needs that after they dial 911, they get a recording that says 
this number is not in service. Please try your call again. In my riding, the police, the fire, the ambulance are available, but nobody knows the 1-800 numbers to reach them. When will Ontario do like every other province in Canada has done and make 911 available everywhere throughout our province? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. Our government takes our public safety very seriously. We've never had a government in my generation that is more concerned with the welfare of all Ontarians. And that's exactly why we're moving forward with our plans for next generation 911. And as the member knows, we are committing over $200 million to work with our local municipal uh, jurisdictions so that they can implement in their jurisdictions the new technology. And as the member knows, Mr. Speaker, the new technology will allow for unprecedented safety and security for all Ontarians. In the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, we believe everyone has a right, an equal right, to live safely in their own communities. Uh, speaker, uh, I'm still waiting for that technology to arrive in Kiwetnuk. Uh, speaker, it's almost been five years since this government received the co chief coroner's report uh, following four deaths linked to a failure of 911 in Northern Ontario. But nothing has changed, Speaker. In Kiwetnuk, the services for ambulance, the services for fire, the services for police range from minimal to non-existent. You cannot call 911 for services uh, that do not exist. Um, when will this government take real action to ensure everyone in Ontario who calls 911 gets the help that they need? Well, thank you, yes. Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for the question. Well, we are acting. That's exactly why we're providing the $208 million supports for municipalities and for regions in the north so that they can begin the transition for next generation 911. When the former government was in power for 15 years, they didn't move the needle. And I have to say, when that, when that party was in power in the early 90s, they didn't realize they had the same issues then with the dialing sequence in some regions that didn't have it. We want every region in Ontario to benefit Order. from the next generation 911. And this technology will allow an unprecedented level of safety. Mr. Speaker, we are not delaying. We are getting the job done. Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Over the last five years, Ontario is garnering a reputation for its world-class manufacturing sector. Employing almost 800,000 workers, we are continuously investing and innovating to stay competitive and produce critical goods that the whole world relies on. And that's why it's imperative for this government to take the right steps to attract investments that will grow the economy and create good jobs. Yeah. Speaker, will the minister please highlight how our government is promoting Ontario's manufacturing sector and keeping it ahead of the, glo the competitive global curve? The minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, we have reduced the cost of doing business in Ontario by $8 billion every year. And according to the latest federal report, Ontario is now the number one investment destination in all of Canada. And with our regional development programs, we're ensuring that we remain that number one site. Just last week, All Season Fencing announced a $4 million investment into their Trenton manufacturing facility. Thank you, Minister Smith, for doing that. They manufacture a sustainable PVC vinyl fencing that's used only recycled plastic. Now, they are creating 19 jobs and acquiring new equipment in Trenton with a $400,000 investment from the province. Speaker, this adds to the $1 billion in investments Bonf. and over 1,800 jobs that companies like All Season Fencing have added to Ontario. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to, to the Minister for the answer and for that information about one of my new regional employers. 
The Regional Development Program has been a game changer for the manufacturing and job creation across the province, especially in our rural economies. In 2018, our government knew that it was long overdue that Ontario once again takes charge of its manufacturing sector after over a decade and a half of Liberal inaction and spur that spurned the manufacturing exodus from the province. This, me this minister has mentioned a number of times that Ontario is now one of the most competitive places to invest and grow a business. Speaker, will the minister please explain what actions have led to Ontario holding this illustrious title? Minister of Economic Development. Speaker, since 2018, Ontario businesses have added 660,000 new jobs. This is despite the fact the Liberals and the NDP voted against every bit of help we offered to those businesses. They watched, though, as we moved swiftly to eliminate 16,000 different red tape items. They watched as we lowered electricity rates and we lowered taxes that were strangling our businesses. And again, they watched as we reshored thousands of jobs back to Ontario, the jobs that were sent running. Yet they voted against every single measure we put forward to create jobs and make it more affordable for families and for businesses. Response. And they continue to vote against attracting billions in investment and making Ontario stronger. Speaker, we're going to keep Ontario competitive because we're open for business. The next question, the member for University of Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Over 100 residents in the town of Rossmore are being threatened with a blatant rent eviction by their new corporate landlord, Bedford Properties. Resident Keith Maybe said this, it's not humane what they have done. You've got people who've been in these apartments right from the time they were built, 37 years ago. Some people are in their 80s and their 90s. That's not right. Premier, what are you going to do to help these residents keep these homes? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. You know, Speaker, a, a part of our commitment to Ontarians under the leadership of Premier Ford is that we're going to have a housing supply action plan tabled in the legislature every year uh, for the four years. We've got a bill before the House right now, Bill 97, the Helping Home Buyers Protecting Tenants Act, and we've been responsive to many of the tenant concerns uh, and also the Human Rights Commission when it comes to uh, air conditioning and units. Many of the recommendations that we put forward on that bill respond directly to some of the concerns that tenants have expressed to our government about rent evictions and landlords' own use. You know, again, Speaker, the, the member keeps asking questions, but she never states on the record whether she's going to support our measures. I'd really love her to do that today. Supplementary question. Back to the Premier. If these tenants are forced to leave their homes, odds are they won't be able to return because Bill 97 does nothing to address the fact that Ontario's eviction laws are too weak to work. The reality is this. If a tenant is illegally evicted, they never get back into their home. The reality is also this. If a landlord illegally evicts a tenant, they almost never get a fine. For the sake of these residents, can you say yes to our amendments in Bill 97 to strengthen Ontario's eviction protection laws? Mr. Mr. Affairs and Housing. You know, one of the best measures the government's done in, as part of our Bill 97 is the, is the measures that the Attorney General have, uh, have announced when it comes to the landlord tenant board. A historic six and a half million dollar commitment to double the amount of adjudicators to support with additional staff members to make sure that the access uh, to justice is, is, is swift and, and, is, and is fair. And I think this is one of the premises that the Attorney General has taken throughout the pandemic, whether it be to stand up against illegal evictions when we were at our most vulnerable as a province, but this latest commitment. This latest, this record-setting commitment by the government to, to invest six and a half million dollars in the landlord tenant board will pay huge dividends to both landlords Spons. and tenants alike, Speaker. The next question, the member for Guelph. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. There are 200,000 acres of greenfield land already approved for development in the Greater Golden Horseshoe. Planners have shown that there are 1.4 million homes currently approved, in process, or under construction, and enough approved development land to build 2 million homes. So it's clear that the only Greenbelt scam is the government scheme to pave over the farmland that feeds us and contributes $50 billion to our food and farming economy, and the wetlands that protect us from flooding and clean our drinking water. So instead of attacking the Greenbelt, let's work together to remove the barriers to build homes in communities that people can afford close to where they work. Speaker, the Premier has a chance to support the farm economy Question. and to make life affordable if he keeps his green belt promise will he keep that promise today to reply the premier well mr speaker i want to thank the the member from build nothing riding because that's what he believes in building absolutely nothing to the point mr speaker it's unheard of that the university of guelph on their property tried to get housing and guess what he didn't support it he didn't support the housing at the University Order. of Guelph. He doesn't believe in building housing in Guelph. They have the lowest per capita housing starts in the entire province. I find it ironic that he's coming up and trying to tell us how to build housing. Well, let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, we have 445,000 people that arrived in Ontario last year and they need homes. We're going to make sure that we hit our target of 1.5 million homes, and I just wish the MPP from Guelph would get on board, support our housing plan, because the people in his community are going to need homes. The supplementary question, back to the member for Guelph. Speaker, with all due respect to the Premier, if he would do a simple Google search of housing starts this year and look at the communities with those housing starts, Guelph is not last. As a matter of fact, Guelph has more housing starts than Peterborough right now. Order. Sorry, my Order. friends from Peterborough. Guelph has more housing starts than Peterborough right now. Order. If the Premier wants to work with me Order. to build, if Order. the Premier wants to work with me to build more side, homes, come to order. let's actually pass my bills 44 and 45 that would get rid of exclusionary zoning so we can actually build homes that people afford in the communities they want to live. So, Speaker, the government has an opportunity today to help Question. people and municipalities save money, to defend our farm economy, and to build affordable homes that people want to live in in affordable communities close to where they work if the government agrees to stop their expensive sprawl agenda and protect the Greenbelt. Will the Premier promise keep will the Premier keep his promise today and promise to protect the Green Belt? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I can't, I can't believe this member is quoting the report that he did. Because what he failed to tell the House is the fact that this report, the success of this report, is because of the measures that our government is putting forward. Speaker, the report he quoted estimates that an additional 150,000 units are going to be created because of the as of right zoning changes that our government's put forward. You voted against those changes oh, sure. for 150,000 homes. Not last. You know, the, the, the <laughs> member is, is very select. This report shows that 5% of those homes are built because of minister zoning orders. Wow. Again, something that that member doesn't support. So again, Speaker, the member needs to get Fonts. his facts straight. The member needs to read the entire report to show that many of the success of these, of these initiatives are directly because of the initiatives this government has right. done under the leadership of President. Once again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair, not directly across the floor of the House. The next question, the member for Newmarket, Aurora. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. Oh, great minister. All workers in Ontario deserve a workplace that is safe. Strong workplace health and safety practices help to make workplaces more productive and reduce the risk of injury. No worker anywhere in our great province should have to go 
to work worried about harm to their health or safety. One worker returning home at the end of the day, not returning home at the end of the day, is one too many. Improving safety for workers is a serious issue, and this must remain as a top priority for this minister and our government. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is addressing safety for workers in Ontario? Labour, immigration, training and skills development. Uh, speaker, I want to thank the member from Newmarket Aurora uh, for this question and for her advocacy in keeping workers in her riding and across the province safe. Speaker, our government under our Premier is leaving no stone unturned on our mission to make our workplaces the safest in the entire world. Ontario is one of the strongest safety records in North America, and that's thanks to everyone — government, workers, labour leaders and businesses — working together. But as long as workers are being injured on the job, our work isn't done. That is why we announced today that we're investing an additional $12.5 million into Ontario's six health and safety associations to improve training, expanding their resources, and saving lives. Yeah. Speaker, we'll continue to invest in education, prevention, and enforcement to ensure Spons? that every worker returns home safely to their families at the end of the day. The member from New Market Royal, supplementary. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for that response, and wonderful to hear about that funding. I am pleased to hear that our government is continuing mm -hmm. to lead the way in strengthening workplace health and safety measures. These valuable investments will help to ensure that our government and workplace partners are working together to eliminate injuries. However, the sad reality is that this last year, 64 workers in Ontario lost their dear lives on the job. We owe it to them and to their loved ones to do better. Unfortunately, one of the leading causes of death on construction sites and in other workplaces is falls from heights. Now, these injuries are devastating, and our government must do more to improve protection Question. for workers. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to increase safety measures for workers in Ontario? Mr. Labour. Speaker, again, uh, to the member for this question. Speaker, I can tell you as Minister of Labour, uh, Nothing um, uh, is more important than the safety of workers, and hearing about fatalities uh, is the most devastating thing that one can hear of uh, every day. Speaker, every one of these workers had hopes, dreams, and families of their own. That is why today I announced we're updating our Working at Heights course to better protect our workers. Working with labour leaders, workers, and businesses, our new course will cover working safely on ladders, skylights, and equipment, as well as the use of PPE. And because safety is never the cost of doing business, our Working for Workers Act 3 is proposing to increase our fines to the highest in the country. We're working hard every day under the leadership of this Premier to make Ontario work for everyone. Next question, the member for London North Centre. Good morning, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. We can all agree that good jobs mean a strong future. The official opposition to that end helped fast-track legislation to make sure that we got the VW deal done. It's entirely unclear who dropped the ball with Stellantis. Order. The workers of this province Order. deserve to see that Order. deal honoured. Ontario Order. is on the brink of a manufacturing revolution, and every day in limbo could cause reputational damage. It could also cause this deal to fall apart. My question, will the Premier meet with the Prime Minister immediately, find out what's gone sideways, use every tool in the toolbox, and get the Stellantis deal over the finish line? And to reply, Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, in the last two and a half years, this government has landed two $25 billion worth of electric vehicle and battery. All of that happened because we lowered the cost of business by $8 billion a year. Now, Ontario has done a deal with Stellantis identical to the deal we did with Volkswagen, and I mean identical in every way, and we are honouring our commitment. <clears throat> 
we know the feds have made a commitment to Stellantis. In fact, in writing, five times they have committed to matching the production incentives of the United States. Five times the, the feds have committed. We are urging Bonds. the federal government to honour their commitment. Thank you, Speaker. That's a very disappointing answer. Losing this Stellantis investment would mean losing thousands of good-paying, unionized jobs in Windsor-Essex, jobs that feed families, support our local economy and charities. We're now seeing a game of jurisdictional football. Premier says it's all up to the federal government. The federal government says the province needs to step up too. My community needs and deserves governments at all levels Order. to do everything in their power to not only protect current jobs, but secure new ones. We need the Premier to take leadership and not just wait for someone else to save Order. the day. Speaker, will the Premier tell my community what specifically he'll do to support Windsor workers and ensure the Stellantis investment isn't lost? Will he step up? And to apply for the government, the Premier. Speaker, you know, it's pretty rich from the member of uh, Windsor to, to say what she just said when for 15 years you could shoot a cannon down the middle of the street of Windsor. Now Windsor is thriving. It's thriving not only to, to the member not support it, she voted against it. She voted against every economic development opportunity Order. down in Windsor. She voted Order. against Stellantis. We're the ones who created the deal. We're going to make sure Windsor that West deal happens Order. on top of the $25 billion of other deals, no matter if it's a battery manufacturer or an auto manufacturer. The member voted against it. They're anti-development, anti-housing, anti-building highways. They're anti-building hospitals. Voted against the hospital in Windsor that we're building. This is about no, 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 no. I think the cheese has slipped off the cracker with that number. There are no points of order considered during question period. Order. Order. Coming from the 800-pound gorilla. Debate is not enhanced in any way, shape, or form by personal insults. Order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Scarborough Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My, my question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture, and Sports. Since the beginning of May, the Guild the Writers Guild of America has been on strike. This strike by the screenwriter is having an impact on film and television shows in the United States. It, it is a concern that strike in America will have a negative impact on film and television industry in Ontario. With many production that are filmed in Toronto, we know that these projects help to support our economy. Speaker, can the minister please tell us if the strike in America will affect the film and television industry in Ontario? And to reply, Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Myself. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the uh, member from Scarborough Centre for the question and recognizing that that might be an issue. But last year, our domestic film and television productions were very strong. Uh, contributing over $1.2 billion to Ontario's economy, an increase of 25 per cent over the previous year. Uh, our homegrown creativity and, and talent and self-reliance gives us a measure of insulation from external factors like the U.S. writer's strike. But I have a little story, Speaker, and I, I won't make it long. About two weeks ago, I was at 
one of Ontario's outstanding world-class destination for tourism, the ROM, at a reception. And on my way walking back later in the evening, I, there was quite a quite a bit going on in the park outside. So I wandered over and see what was going on, and there were lights and Aunts. so many people. It was production, TV production, yeah. Mr. Speaker, outside. Workers working, talent running around, watching it happen is pretty special. Thank you. A supplementary question. I thank the minister for his answer. It's good news to know that our local film and television industry is strong at this time. However, it is important to look to the future as well. It is great to hear that this industry helped with job creation and helped grow Ontario's economy, but we need to make sure that this industry will continue to grow in the future. Speaker, can the minister please tell us how our government is supporting more film and television production made in Ontario? Mr. Tourism, Culture and Sport. Again, I'd like to uh, thank the member for the question. And firsthand, uh, lots of meetings have gone on in the last five or six months about talking about production and talking about what's going on in our province. And it's an industry that's thriving, Mr. Speaker. Um, we are supporting the film and television thanks to the leadership of our Premier and the Minister of Finance, with more than $814 million budgeted towards three film and television tax credits for 2023. This draws people to our province to do their productions from the United States, Mr. Speaker. This drives business, drives jobs. Not talking about the talent, but the jobs, the careers, Mr. Speaker. It's not just getting someone in for working for a day, it's long-term careers. Thanks to many of the people within our ministry, or in our, I'm sorry. Response? In, uh, what, do we call, what do we call this thing? Our, uh, our party? Yeah. Our party drives jobs, Mr. Minister, or Mr. Speaker, and uh, the film industry is the beneficiary of it, as is television. Thank you. Next question, the member for London West. Thank you, uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, the W. Sherwood Fox School Council, along with more than 30 students and parents, sent a package of letters to the Thames Valley District School Board pleading for help. Daily violent incidents and code yellow lockdowns, more frequent than ever before, have left students feeling scared and anxious about going to school. Parents feel desperate, and they worry every morning when they drop off their kids. Every student's learning is being disrupted, and the entire school community is being traumatized. What specific actions will this government take now to deal with the alarming rise in violence at W. Sherwood Fox Public School in London and schools across this province? Minister of Education. Uh, well, we certainly uh, share the concern of the rise of crime and violence taking place across communities across the country, and we're seeing impacts in our school communities affecting staff and, of course, our kids. Uh, it's why, Speaker, from 2018, where I think many members opposite will speak to root causes, when it comes to mental health supports, pre-pandemic and post, the Premier and the government increased funding from $18 million to $114 million in student mental health, a 550 per cent increase in support to help that school and every school afflicted by the rise of violence, behavioral issues, and other concerns impacting kids. We've increased the amount of adults, caring adults, in the room. There's nearly 8,000 more staff, notwithstanding there's been a flat number of children, students within our schools. Response? Mr. Speaker, we've also enhanced the mental health literacy, mandatory learning, more people, more literacy, more curriculum, and of course, more mental health supports to keep students safe in their schools. Speaker, W. Sherwood Fox desperately needs more EAs. It needs a funded sensory room. It needs regular, ongoing support from social workers, psychologists, OTs, school support counselors, child and youth workers, and others. But this school is not unique. This government's chronic underfunding of public education is failing Ontario students, especially students with special needs. The Thames Valley District School Board is spending $5 million more 
on spec ed than it is receiving. While violence in school escalates and staff injuries increase. Speaker, will this government commit today to providing the funding our schools need so they are safe for students, staff and parents? Minister of Education. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've increased staff by 8,000 more since we started. 2,000 additional teachers are being brought into schools this September specifically to boost literacy and math scores because we believe, as progressive conservatives, we've got to get back to the basics to strengthen fluency in what actually matters in the classroom reading, writing, math, and STEM education, and more pathways to the skilled trades. Mr. Speaker, we've increased funding in mental health. The overall funding envelope in education is up for the coming September by $690 million. The overall education budget, when you compare it to the peak of spending under former Premier Wynne, is 27 per cent higher. Now, I recognize fully that we're going to continue to do more. In every single budget, we'll increase funding. We'll continue to hire more people. And we'll continue to make the case, as a former school board trustee, that the school boards involved, everyone involved in it, public education, Response. should be doing better, which is why I urge the members opposite. If they want a better school, they should vote for the Better Schools and Student Outcomes Act to demand better for children in this province. The next question, the member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Colleges and Universities. All Ontarians deserve to have access to the health care they need when they need it, no matter where they live. In my riding of Chatham Kent Leamington, my constituents are looking for connected care and services that are close to home in Wheatley and Leamington, Blenheim, Ridgetown, and beyond. Unfortunately, because of the destructive policies of the past Liberal government, many parts of our province are in desperate need of more health care professionals to provide that care. Our government must take decisive steps now to educate and retain more health care workers across the province to make immediate impacts in our local hospitals, long-term care homes, and other health care facilities. Yeah, yeah. Speaker, can the minister please explain what our government is doing to expand opportunities to educate more health care professionals? Minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the great question. Yesterday, alongside the Minister of Health, we announced that applications are now open for the much-anticipated Ontario Learn and Stay grant. Yeah. Speaker, months of hard work and dedication led up to what was a very successful launch of the program, with over 700 students applying to the Learn and Stay website within the first 24 hours. This is a win-win for both post-secondary students and underserved communities across the province. Not only does it offer a sizable financial con contribution for students, it also has the power to make a significant impact in the local communities that need it most. Speaker, it's clear that students are eager to begin their careers in nursing, and I'm confident our government's approach of offering financial support will make all the difference between someone considering a career in health care and Response. someone who actually pursues it. And this grant clearly demonstrates that unlike previous governments, this government is taking concrete actions. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It's so encouraging to hear the grant application process is now open. This is welcome news to my constituents and for communities across Ontario. The financial supports available through this grant program are a positive step in building up this precious workforce. However, there are some regions in our province still in need of health care professionals, and that's more urgent. It's up to our government to implement solutions that respond to local health care needs. Speaker, can the minister please explain how the investments made by our government into the Learn and Stay grant will benefit communities that are currently underserved? Good. Mr. Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I am happy to say that starting this September, students from the members' riding of Chatham-Kent-Leamington will be eligible to apply for the grant. Oh, this grant will touch every corner of the province, and that includes ridings held by members of the opposition, with 49 eligible programs at institutions in those ridings currently including the program. Where specifically do you ask? Ottawa West, West Nepean, Mishkugawak James Bay, Temiskaming Cochrane. Thunder Bay Superior North, Kuwetnong, Algoma Manitoulin, Ottawa Vanier, Windsor West, Kingston the Islands, London North Centre and Sudbury. With the constituency week coming up, I hope that each of the members representing the ridings I just mentioned, as well as the other members, will continue to uh, talk about this grant in their ridings because Premier Ford and Response. the PC government are delivering for Great. their communities. Great. 
question, the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Thank you, Speaker. This question is to the Minister of Community and Social Services. The Galbraiths have been waiting for an assisted living space for their son since 2014. Imagine day after day, year after year, writing letters, emails, making phone calls, and hearing nothing but crickets. Wow. Can the minister tell this family when they will be offered an assisted living space for their son? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for, uh, for the question. Mr. Speaker, what we have done in the ministry or just across government, we had to make sure that the services and the funds that uh, the service providers need are there for them. Mr. Speaker, one of, the th one of the first things that we did is when we formed governments, we looked at some of the challenges that the service providers were facing were the same ones they had, they had, they had facing 10, 15 years prior to us uh, forming government, Mr. Speaker. That wasn't good enough for us. What we said we were going to do is work with the service Service providers to make sure that the services that the children, youth, and families are, are in need of is not only there, but it's there to, to for families faster and in a way where they need it and where uh, in a way where it's expedited and processed faster, Mr. Speaker. The, the, sir, we were, we've been working directly with service providers to make sure that happens. We make sure that the funds are there to, for, for the service providers, and we'll make sure that the, the services and the supports the families rely on are there uh, now and into the future, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I learned today that adults with developmental uh, disabilities have brought a class action suit against the government. The complaint is about the negligent operation of a social assistance system that has approved the delivery of much-needed support and services, but then fails to follow up. Can the government tell us, really, when people can expect to have the services delivered? Eight years is far too long for a family to be waiting for, to receive res supports. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I agree with the member. It wasn't, it wasn't right. It wasn't enough, which is why we're improving the system, which is why we increased funding, which is why we're working across government to make sure that the services that the families rely on is there. If you look at the programs that we have, Mr. Speaker, for example, Journey to Belonging that we have put forward, we are making sure that the services that people rely on are there for them when they need them, Mr. Speaker. And that makes, that, that's uh, by making sure that the funding that's required is there in place for them. That's just, that's just the way that we've been working since we formed government. We had to look at a redesigning system that was left neglected by the previous government. And unfortunately, throughout their time, your party supported them. You didn't do anything about it. It was this government that had to step in and fix the mistakes of the previous government, and we're doing that. How are we doing it? In collaboration with service spots, by listening to families, and by listening to those who are needing, who need the services, and we'll, we will not let them down in the process. Again, I'll remind members to make their comments through the chair. The next question, the member for Brampton North. Thank you, Speaker. Um, and my question is for uh, Ontario's Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Now, uh, women entrepreneurs are an integral part of Ontario's economy, accounting for nearly 20% of all small and medium-sized businesses in Ontario. I'm very proud to consider. Uh, that, uh, that my mother, Leslie, uh, is, is one of that 20%. Uh, now, now, 20 per cent is a big number, uh, but I think all members of the House could agree uh, that that number could be quite a bit higher. And the reality is that women continue to encounter social and economic barriers when it comes to starting and growing their businesses. While recent numbers show that there is an increase in overall employment for women, uh, more must be done to increase opportunities for women entrepreneurs. Uh, speaker, uh, could the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to unlock even more economic opportunities for women? The Associate Minister of Women's Social and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the great member of Brampton North. And I look forward to being with the member next week, and we'll have the opportunity to visit one of the recently announced expansion locations for the Investing in Women's Futures program. This amazing program is expanding to 10 new locations across the province, and Brampton is receiving one of them. Mr. Speaker, we heard first-hand accounts from women of some of the unique and disproportionate economic barriers women face when starting, growing, 
or scaling up their businesses. And that's why our government is taking a multi-prong approach to unlock more opportunities for women in the post-pandemic economy. We are supporting women as they enter and re-enter the workforce with programs like the Investing Women's Futures Program and the Women's Economic Security Program. And Spons? we're opening opportunities for women to pursue entrepreneurship as a flexible career path with the regional innovation centers and the small business enterprise networks. Because of this, women are breaking down barriers, growing their businesses, and getting it done for themselves, their families, and Ontario. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, a supplementary question for the Minister, and, and this is Brampton to Brampton, so we need a, a straight answer. Uh, there, are, uh, there, there are over 370,000 jobs that are going unfilled in the skilled trades today, with one in three journey persons who are over, uh, over the age of 55, and uh, many of them are heading towards retirement. Uh, over the next decade, Ontario will need 100,000 workers in the construction sector alone to meet this growing demand. The unfortunate reality is that women currently account, uh, only account for 5% of the skilled trades workforce. Uh, and our government must act now to ensure that we address the labour shortage and help more women to pursue these in-demand, rewarding and well-paying careers. Building a stronger Ontario means that we need more workers to help grow our businesses, our, our communities and our economy. Speaker, could the minister please explain how our government is expanding opportunities for women to pursue careers in the skilled trades? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and the member from Brampton North is absolutely right. And I'm telling you, I'm on a mission to get more women into the trades because when you've got a trade, you've got a trade for life, according to our Premier, and he's right too. Our government is investing in a historic $1.5 billion over four years into the skilled trades strategy, and many initiatives will support women and girls in exploring the skilled trades, like the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program, the Pre-Apprenticeship Training Program, and the Achievement Incentive program. Thank you to our Minister of the long acronym. <laughs> these, these investments enhance opportunities for girls and women to tour college trades programs, participate in workshops, and be men mentored by female apprenticeships and journey persons. And that's why I will continue to work alongside the Minister Response. of Labour, Immigration, yeah. Trade, Skill Development <laughs> with our partners in labour unions and businesses to change the skilled trade culture to ensure that women who enter the trades stay in the trades, because when women succeed, Ontario yeah. succeeds. The uh, government house leader, I gather, has a point of order. Yeah. I'd just like to uh, take a moment to wish the Minister of Red Tape Production a very happy birthday. Yeah. The member for Thornhill has a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I wish to remind everybody about the Centre for uh, Israel and Jewish Affairs reception that's happening in room 228 and 230, just following these, uh, these proceedings. Thank you. Member for Carleton has a point of order. Again. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just wanted to introduce a very special person from the City of Ottawa, a 21-year veteran of the Ottawa Police Service. Deputy Police Chief Steve Bell has joined us here in the Ontario Legislature today. Welcome. So have a standing order. Point of order, the Minister of Energy. Thank you, Speaker. I would uh, like to welcome uh, Lauren Brooker, host of The Lauren Brooker Show on 800 CJBQ, and his very capable assistant, Jim Gibbs, and thank all of the members of the Legislature who joined us for his broadcast this morning in the Government House Leader's office. And thank you to the Government House Leader for letting us use your invited. boardroom this morning. I Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Guelph has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Premier concerning protecting the Green Belt. This matter will be debated today following private members' public business. No further business this morning. This House stands in recess until 3 p.m.